Prince Regent George, next in line for the throne, and one of the most infamous playboys of the period in Britain known as the Regency era. It took a lot to raise eyebrows in those days, of extravagant fashion and questionable moral behaviour, but George, or Prinny as he was known to his friends, topped the lot. Years of womanising, big drinking and reckless gambling earned him a scathing public image and debts north of £600,000, a truly eye-watering sum at the time. Even princes have to repay their debts, and with the collectors knocking on his door, George had to beg Parliament to bail him out. And backed into a corner, he could escape from this precarious position by agreeing to Parliament's single condition. He was to marry his cousin, Caroline, and provide the country with an heir. Simple. Or in this case, not so. No, the fact that they were first cousins wasn't the issue here. That's practically traditional for the royal family. Prinny had secretly married his first love, Maria Fitzherbert, several years earlier. Recognised as an intellectual woman with a sharp wit, and by all contemporary accounts, a famous beauty. Who can argue with that? So why the secrecy? Well, she was also a commoner and a Catholic. Two small facts that made the whole thing illegal. This is Tilney Street. The size of her home, and where they were married in secret by a curate who desperately needed the £500 that George bribed, I mean, paid him. Most of this street is exactly as it was, but sadly, this block of glass and steel stands exactly where her grand home once did. An outstanding woman by all accounts, but according to his father, King George III, the marriage was illegal, so the certificates were ripped up, null and void. Brinney had a duty to fulfil. Introducing the bride to be, Caroline of Brunswick, Despite having been extremely strictly brought up, being denied even the most basic contact with males of any kind, she had been described as most amiable, lively, playful, witty, as an attractive girl with curly fair hair. Like modern times with Instagram filters, the accounts of Caroline that made it to England may have been a little bit liberal with the truth. When Lord Malmesbury arrived in Germany to escort Caroline to her wedding, his first impressions were, despite being not tall or a beauty, and apart from being tactless, rude, indiscreet, and often neglecting to wash or even change her underwear, she was a very nice girl, or words to that effect. And despite being first cousins, George and Caroline met for the first time here at St. James's Palace, and George was horrified. He had been royally stitched up. Upon their first embrace, Prinny was so overcome by her stale stench that he ambled off to the other side of the room, where he said to Malmesbury, Harris, I'm not well. Pray get me a glass of brandy. Well, let's not forget that the playboy Prinny was no oil painting himself, and Caroline herself remarked that George was a great deal fatter than she'd been led to believe. Ah, love of first sight. So, with his previous marriage bluntly annulled and Maria Fitzherbert downgraded from wife to mistress, Prince George rented out Marble Hill House in Twickenham for her to stay, away from prying eyes. This is the house that his grandfather, George II, had built for his mistress, Henrietta Howard, so Prinny gets no points for originality here. But as they say, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And unfortunately for us, fixing the house is exactly what they were doing when I cycled past during a lockdown. But it's amusing to imagine Maria watching from one of these windows, the prince restlessly riding his horse to and fro in the grounds on the eve of his wedding. I wonder how many brandies he'd had that day. In a commanding display of how not to prepare for a wedding, Prinny continued to drink brandy for three solid days leading up to his big day. And he was in such a state when he took his vows that he had to be held up by his good friend and Regency legend Beau Brummel in St. James's Chapel, right behind this window. Caroline claimed that George was so drunk later that day that he passed out in the bedroom before the marriage could even be consummated. But despite all of this, they managed to conceive a child the very next day. And for Prinny, it required no small effort to conquer my aversion and overcome the disgust of her person. And shortly after, George wrote her a note saying essentially that they should have no further obligations to one another and that she could do as she pleased so that they could make the best of a situation unfortunate for us both. 
Though still George's wife, Caroline moved to Greenwich, an affluent maritime spot in South East London, a place not short of a hunky naval officer or two. She took up residence in Montague House, just a stone's throw away from the Rangers House, which is used as the Bridgerton's family abode in the popular series. And during her 15 years or so living here, Princess Caroline was the focal point of some seriously debaucherous rumours. Now a sociable and confident woman, the princess hosted famously wild parties at Montague House and was visibly linked to several prominent Greenwich men. They say that she was often partial to dancing around in front of her guests in the most indecent and naked manner. Word was spreading and Prinny had a royal commission set up called the Delicate Investigation for a detailed look into these rumours. And despite the task force's possible over-enthusiasm for discovering the squalid truth, nothing concrete could ever be proven against her. So the party roared on. Montague House is sadly gone now, but ironically, the single reminder from this fun house is Caroline's personal bath sunk into the ground at Greenwich Park. Could it be that the rumours of her horrible hygiene and infidelity were somewhat exaggerated by the prince? Or perhaps these tiles played host to a few of the fabled sex parties? We'll never know. A few years after she left for Europe, the house was demolished. So, how does this story end? Well, while in Europe, Caroline was famously and widely parodied for being the mistress to Napoleon's brother-in-law. Despite this, she was still hugely popular in England, and when Prince George was crowned king in 1820, Caroline became queen. Parliament offered her £50,000 never to return to Britain, but to everyone's dismay, she returned to Brandenburg House in Hammersmith to much public fun for her. Brandenburg House was demolished not long after she passed away, and there are sadly not any visual reminders to be found amongst the flashy Fulham Reach development which has been built right on its site. With her track record, houses must have been terrified of her moving in. Among the people of England, however, she was still hugely popular. While her husband's extravagant living and general incompetence was looked most unfavourably upon, she had been very publicly treated unfairly by George, and her sordid tales had become something of a national obsession. She was explicitly told not to attend George's coronation at Westminster Abbey. But with the wind in her sails, she had other ideas. And this is where it all ends rather abruptly for Princess Caroline. She arrived at Westminster Abbey, demanding to be let inside, but had the doors slammed in her face at the orders of Prinny. The ensuing humiliating public display lost her a great deal of support. And in the 19 days following the coronation, her health rapidly declined until her death at a Hammersmith home. Coincidence? Some say not. Well, there it is. My mind is made up. I'm never going to marry my cousin. Thanks, George. Appreciate the guidance. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you did, please give me a like. It means a lot at this stage, and it's going to encourage me to go out there and find more crazy histories in this massive city. We've got 2,000 years to play with, so that's it for this time. I'll see you next time.